Chris from Sailing Vessel Navigator in the Bahamas. Welcome to Advanced Concepts in Celestial Navigation. In this video series, we'll build upon what you already know to the point where you can navigate exclusively by objects in the sky anytime, day or night, any day of the year. In this episode, we'll take a look at our tools of our trade, one more look at the marine sextant, as well as our understanding of the nautical almanac. Along the way, we'll have a frank discussion about accuracy, where it's important and where it's not. Finally, we'll end with another look at some of the tasks that we've previously used tables for and how we can calculate them by hand if we want to. But first, let's take a look at where you should feel comfortable before we begin. At this point, you should feel very comfortable navigating with the nautical almanac, the sight reduction tables, and a theory of celestial navigation anytime during the day, finding your position pretty accurately. But I'd like to return to where we began, a closer look at the marine sextant. There's two types of errors we'll talk about. The first has to do with your ability to use the sextant, and the second has to do with the sextant itself. So what can you do to become more accurate with the sextant? Here's three tips. Tip number one is to time the sight yourself. Correct your watch as often as possible and wear it on the inside of your wrist. When you get the object on the horizon, calmly glance at your watch and read the time. Don't look at the sextant until you write down the time. If you want to go one step further, mentally count thousands from the moment you mark the object to the moment you look at the watch. For instance, I always subtract one second from my time, the interval of moving my head and focusing my eyes. Only write down the sextant value once the time is accurately recorded. It's easy to write down the wrong time, an hour or five minutes difference. You'd be surprised how often it happens. Tip number two is to read the sextant correctly. Read it, write down the value, and then do something else and read it again. It's easy to flip numbers and end up ruining your sight for a silly error. Tip number three is to average your sights. Take five measurements of the same body and either use graph paper or math to average the times and heights. You might be surprised how often there's an outlier in there that needs to get tossed out. If you don't live near the ocean, a bubble attachment or an artificial horizon is a good way to get some practice time in at home. So what about accuracy in the sextant itself? Well, there's four real adjustments that you should be familiar with. They all deal with keeping things uh, parallel and perpendicular to each other. For instance, the two mirrors need to be perpendicular to the frame and the telescope needs to be parallel. The first error is called collimation error, and that just means that the light coming into the telescope should be parallel. It's not usually a big deal, and it really only happens if somebody drops the sextant or if it's all grossly misaligned. And the best way to do that is to just look through the horizon mirror and make sure that the telescope is not all jacked up. That's not really an adjustment that's uh, it's too critical because you'll notice that if it's an issue. But the remaining three adjustments uh, deal with the mirrors. The first adjustment deals with the index mirror and it's called perpendicularity error. And it's dealt with with this screw in the back. The remaining two errors involve the horizon mirror. The first error is called um, side error and that deals with um, making sure that objects that are perpendicular in the frame are straight. And the last one is called index error, which is something we're familiar with. We do that every time. Either way, there's two, two screw adjustments on the back of the horizon mirror, one for side error and one for index error. So there's three screws, three errors to take care of. Let's take a closer look at how to deal with each one. No matter what type of sextant you have, the adjustments are usually pretty similar. To adjust for perpendicularity error in the index arm, we'll set the sextant on a flat surface and we'll remove the telescope. Then we'll take two identical objects, for instance dominoes, and we'll set them on the measurement arm so that when you look in the index mirror with one eye, you can see both objects at the same time. If there's any error, there will be a step, and it's usually pretty apparent. So what you'll want to do is adjust the screw on the index mirror until the two objects come in line, and then you'll know you've removed as much perpendicularity error as possible. To remove side error and index error in the horizon mirror, you usually want to use an object far away, but I'm going to use a close object to demonstrate in this case. As you move the horizon mirror back and forth across a vertical object, you'll see it apparently jumps from mirror to mirror. That indicates side error. So you need to adjust the side error screw until the objects come close into a line. Similarly, We've mathematically adjusted for index error before, but if we want to take it out of the sextant, find a horizontal object, and adjust the 
index error screw until the horizon comes in a line. Now since these two screws are on the same mirror, sometimes you have to go back and forth and find the sweet spot between the two adjustments. So a cross-shaped object usually is the best thing to look at. So now that we've adjusted the sextant as best as possible, the last adjustment involves your mind. There's three cases of celestial navigation that you need to be aware of. The first is open ocean, where your accuracy is not really that important. The second is cases where your safety does depend on it. If you're passing a low atoll in the Pacific, give yourself a wide margin of your uh, DR path, but an even wider margin for your celestial navigation errors and be as accurate as possible. The third are academic cases. Perhaps you're studying for U your U.S. Coast Guard Merchant Mariner's license or the license in your home country where precision and accuracy absolutely depend on um, getting everything right. So make sure that you, you keep in mind where you are and how you're using celestial navigation and it'll become a lot more enjoyable. One of those academic cases involves abnormal conditions. True, you could make these corrections if you want to, but they're typically so small that it doesn't matter. In our case, we'll correct for index error and height of eye just like normal. That will give us an apparent altitude, but when we enter the apparent altitude tables, we see that our site is too low, so we need to use the next page of the Nautical Almanac to correct for low sites. The atmospheric refraction makes sometimes a big difference in what you're observing. But we also need to correct for temperature and pressure variations, so if we flip the page in the Nautical Almanac, there's a table to correct for pressure and temperature differences. It's pretty straightforward once you take a hard look at it. You calm down the column and pull out the correction that you need. And that's all there is to it. The last concept we'll cover in this episode is how to directly calculate the computed height and azimuth angle of any body at any time. It means that you can avoid using the tables in HO229 if you want to. It appeals more to the mathematically inclined amongst you, but I want to show you the technique so that you can decide whether to use the tables or direct calculation when the time comes. So we'll assume that we have a DR position, a declination, and a GHA from a different example. The first thing we need to do is convert to decimal notation, and we do that by taking the minutes portion of the figure and dividing it by 60. Once we've got everything in decimal notation, we can calculate an LHA, and then at this point we would normally enter the tables, but instead we're going to write down two formulas. One accounts for computed height, and one accounts for azimuth. Here's the formula. It looks complex, but it's really not. If you have a programmable calculator, you can enter all these figures in no problem. I'll illustrate it by hand using a calculator, of course, but this will show you how the process works. L stands for latitude, D stands for declination, and LHA stands for LHA. Just using the trigonometric functions on the calculator, we can note things to four decimal places, and that's usually pretty accurate. So once we do out the math, we come up with a figure, but that's the sign of our computed height. How do we find the actual computed height? We take the arc sign. So if we shift the sign over to the other side and take the exponent, we'll come up with the value. Luckily on most calculators, there's an arc sign function. Once we have our computed height and decimal notation, we can convert it back to regular notation for our plotting, or we can just leave it because we'll need it in our next portion of the problem. To convert decimals back to regular notation, take the decimal portion and multiply it by 60. To calculate the azimuth, there's another formula. It also looks complex, but if you look at the values, it's not too bad. It's the same kind of thing. D stands for declination, L for latitude, and HC for computed height. Again, you could do this on a programmable calculator quite easily. We'll just illustrate it real quick with the regular calculator to four decimal places. Again, we'll take the arc cosine to determine the true azimuth. However, there's an azimuth rule where if the GP is west of the AP, the azimuth is 360 minus the figure that you calculated, similar to looking in the tables. So just as a quick recap, you need to calculate a latitude, a declination, and an LHA, convert them to decimal notation, plug them into the formulas, remember your arc sine and arc cosine functions, and you can calculate the values directly. It comes in pretty handy from time to time.
One thing to keep in mind is that when calculating directly, we almost always don't use an assumed position. We'll plot from the dead reckoning position, towards or away along the azimuth line, a distance which is equal to the difference between the computed height and the measured height. A good way to practice this technique is to use the tables and then also directly calculate from the assumed position. That way you'll come up with identical figures. However, if you just use the direct calculation, you generally skip the assumed position step. In this episode, we've taken a look at sextant adjustments, accuracy, and manual calculations. Every navigator has a different level of interest and competence in these areas, so use it as you see fit. In the next episode, we'll open up the night sky and talk about stars and planets. Until then, practice what you've learned, refer to the notes below, and when you're ready, we'll move on.